Okay. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm welcoming you because Abram's not here today. Um, so welcome to worship at Union Congregational Church. Um, this is the second Sunday in Lent. Uh, and we're going to have um, Ken Barnes preaching for us today. So we're looking forward to that. Um, and I think, is Brian here? Uh he he has a pre-recorded prelude ah okay so we are going to hear brian play the prelude now Oh, it's good thing. Paul Seabury, I think I think it's your turn. Are you frozen there? Looks like you might be frozen. For Paul and Daddy, I think we have yeah. a technical glitch. Why don't we, why don't we, uh, mute Paul? Why don't we mute Paul? Okay. And I will uh, put on the first hymn. Or I can read the psalm. Why don't I read the psalm? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So this is Psalm 22, everyone, beginning at verse 23. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he heard. 
From thee comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. Now maybe if we could have the, the hymn. Uh, you're, you're staticky, Paul. All we can hear is static.
Does he, are you on Much YouTube? better. Much yeah. better. <laughs> a great and holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, maker of all things, that which we can see and that which was beyond us. We invite you to be with us this morning. We are your people and we desire your presence to be among us. Also, Lord, we pray for your help to quiet our hearts and minds so that we may see only you. We ask that you will teach us so that we may learn better how to love and serve you. Amen. Okay. Uh, did work? Yes, it did. That, that worked fine. Don't look at me like it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I am going to uh, create breakout rooms for passing of the peace. We're being invited to a breakout room. I don't want to go. I think that's it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Where are we? Oh, I think you're frozen, Aaron. Aaron's frozen. Yeah, you're not, Paul. Paul is okay. Yeah. No, I think he's frozen too. <laughs> Sorry. Well, we can talk. Can you hear us? I guess not. Well, I could do a solo again. <laughs> I didn't know I was not muted when I was singing. Apologies to those of you that had to hear me. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Max. Uh, Can you hear us now? Yes. I, I, uh, oh, you're Abram today, Paul. I yes, I, I don't, I couldn't uh, find out how to change the name. So, <laughs> how are you doing? Good, good. How about you, Paul CV? Oh, I think you're muted. Oh, I think you're muted. Yeah, he, he um, is having trouble with his audio. Oh. What have you been up to lately? Oh, okay. um, Well, the, the Dynagati went up to Maine last week. So they, uh, for snowboarding, uh, and they enjoyed themselves. And we enjoyed ourselves. Where, where in Maine? Uh, Sunday River. OK. Great weather. This yeah, they, they said it was, uh, I think, perfect weather. Karen making a pair, she and your name. Uh, she left this room because I, 
I, we, Aaron and yeah. Paul were having difficulty. So we were just talking to ourselves until you came in. Yeah. And uh, so. Paul still having. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, can I have an introduction to? Yes, I'm so sorry, <laughs> Paul. This is this is Taylor. This is my girlfriend. I'm Taylor. <laughs> nice to meet you. All right. Yes. As opposed to Abram T. Miles Jones. Yeah. <laughs> the introductions become a little bit harder when we when we use fake Zoom names. <laughs> Oh, Paul, I love the, um, the Fair Exchange chocolate. Oh, yes. Oh, so good. I think <laughs> I'm, I'm probably going to order uh, another batch the next time around. It lasted me a while. Okay. Glad you like it. Taylor, Taylor lives up in Salem, but she works up in Boston. So you're, you're fading in and out. Sorry. So I was just saying that um, Taylor lives up in Salem and she, she works up in, in Gloucester for the Gloucester. Okay. But Magnolia, I, I always want to get over to Magnolia. Uh-huh. Oh, so pretty over there. <laughs> yeah. So I should uh, tell everyone one, one minute. Okay. Do you, do you live in Gloucester? Excuse me? Do you live in Gloucester? Uh, Essex. Essex, okay. Oh, are they yeah, yeah. I was with Max when he picked up the truck. Oh, okay, yes. So, yeah. <laughs> Essex is great. Okay. Yes. You guys lived there a long time? Uh, I, uh, we lived at the over the church um, when we first moved up to the North Shore, and uh, then we bought this house with uh, Rick uh, Quinn, who died. I remember Rick. And uh, so that was, uh, I think, two years ago, and. Um, our daughter and her husband and son are living on the other side now. Oh, fun. Okay. Yeah. That's really, that's a great opportunity to have you at all. Anyway. Yeah. Well, and your son and his wife and their children are also yes. living there. <laughs> right. So the We've got game. a compound. Oh, wow. It's yeah. a compound. It's a gotti compound. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Well, I'm going to uh, close the rooms. Nice meeting, okay. Taylor. Oh, we have another minute. I we have to find something to say for sixty <laughs> seconds. Where Paul? Where's your favorite place to see light? Our favorite place to see light. Favorite place to see light? Yeah, just a fun question. Just <laughs> ask a minute. <laughs> Uh, like light from the sun. It could be light from the sun. It could be light from like a, like a yeah, on well, a billboard on on my deck, uh, in the back. Uh, that I like to sit in the sun. Especially by Essex, I can imagine just the marsh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah.
Ken, can someone do the reading for Paul? Yep, I'll happily do the reading. Romans 4, starting in verse 13. But don't we have a song first or no? Oh, yeah. Uh, this was, this is. The song? Oh, yes. Yes. I'll play the song first and then you can do the first reading. Great. Right. Thank you. 
And now for our first reading from the book of Romans, chapter 4, beginning at verse 13. If you want to follow along, it's Romans 4, beginning at verse 13. Hear now the word of God. For the promise of Abraham, or to his descendants, that he would be heir of the world, was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it is by faith that it might be in accordance with grace, in order that the promise may be certain to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham who is the father of all of us. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. In the sight of him who believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. In hope against hope he believed, in order that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which has been spoken, so shall your descendants be. And without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured that what he had promised, he was able to perform. Therefore also it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was reckoned to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be reckoned, and those who believe in him who was raised from the dead, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He who was delivered up because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Now I'd like to share with you <clears throat> our second reading, after which I'll share a short sermon. Reading from Mark 8. Now the lectionary says, verse 31 to 38. Now I don't make up lectionaries. Far be it for me to criticize those who do. But in this case, I think they got it a little wrong. We're going to start at verse 27. Because I don't think verse 31 makes any sense if you don't have verses 27 to 30. So this is Mark 8, 27 to 38. Hear now the word of God. Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do people say that I am? They told him, saying, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, or others say one of the prophets of old. And he continued questioning them. But who do you say that I am? Jesus asked them. And Peter answered, you are the Christ. And he warned them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And as he was stating this matter plainly, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. And he summoned the crowd with his disciples. And he said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. 
For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to us anew. Help us to understand these difficult words. Teach us what we need to know. Show us what we need to see. And help us to apply these words to our lives as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I want to set the scene for you, if I may. I want to talk a little bit about Jesus' ministry and his journey. You know, he starts off in Nazareth. Now, Nazareth is really nowhere. Um, there's a wonderful story when he, he calls Andrew and Peter, uh, and, and uh, Andrew says, Nazareth, has anything good ever come out of Nazareth? There's never been a prophet from Nazareth. No one of any import has ever been from Nazareth. Look on a map. Nazareth is in the middle of nowhere. But when Jesus leaves Nazareth to go up to Galilee, and I'm talking about the whole region, not just any particular part of the lake, although we know he concentrates early on in Capernaum, he goes to a region which is really unusual in all of Israel because it's actually quite an independent region. It's independent in many ways from all of the ruling authorities, the Jewish authorities, as well as the Roman authorities. In fact, it's a primarily Gentile region. And it was because of that, a kind of hotbed of new ideas. And it's in this hotbed of new ideas where this person from Nazareth of all places comes to this pretty important region and he starts preaching a new word. He starts preaching a gospel they've never heard before. And he starts with a ragtag group of people. You know, he calls Peter and Andrew, these, these fishermen, and James and John, these sons of Zebedee, uh, probably the most least likely perfect people that you would, you would start a movement with. But he does. He choose, chooses these ordinary fishermen. And I think of Capernaum actually a little bit like Gloucester, you know? It's a lot, in fact, like Gloucester. It's this kind of seaport town that maybe has seen its better days, but it's still very important regionally. It's very important locally. They have a synagogue there. That's really important because he has a place to teach the remnant of the Jewish people that are in this largely Gentile area. But with his teaching, he also performs miracles. He starts to demonstrate who he is. And people start becoming really interested. And slowly but surely, this little tiny movement in this little tiny fishing village, led by this man from this totally unimportant town of Nazareth, starts to pick up momentum. And he starts to have a following. And at this point in the ministry, Jesus pivots. And he goes in to the mountains. And as he moves into the mountains, he starts picking up more followers. He picks up Matthew. He picks up, in fact, the rest of the 12. And he starts to pe uh, teach the people in the countryside a gospel they've never heard before, much of which is found in the Sermon on the Mount. 
he starts talking about really weird things and difficult things. And he starts saying things that people have never heard from any other prophet, like, blessed be the poor? Blessed be the meek? Love your enemies? Turn the other cheek? I mean, he starts talking about things that are resonating with these poor mountain folk. These people who are the outcasts of Israeli society of the day. These northerners. And now he really starts to pick up momentum. And for a while he decides he's going to go back to Nazareth. His hometown. But what happens when he goes back to Nazareth? His family thinks he's nuts. His family thinks he's crazy. And at one point he's teaching in the synagogue and they say, hey, who is this guy? Isn't this the carpenter's son? And his mother and his brothers are outside the synagogue and they come and they say, your mothers and your brother, they're, they're, they're here to rescue you from yourself because they think you're crazy. And Jesus says, who's my mother? Who are my brothers? These broken people are my people. These sad, lonely people that everybody else in the world has turned their back on, they're my brothers. They're my mother. And then he does something really interesting. He takes the 12 disciples, having trained them now in this new gospel, and he sends them out. And they go out, and then they come back, and they report marvelous things. They say, Jesus, you will not believe what we've been able to do in your name. We've been casting out demons. We've been healing the sick. We've been doing exactly the things, these miraculous things that you do because we do them in your name. And of course, they don't understand yet that it's the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus pivots back. And he heads back to Galilee, where it all started. But something happened, something really important that I think we forget. And that is Jesus learns while he's back in Galilee that Herod has killed John the Baptist. And this touches Jesus in a very unique way for a few reasons. One, because John the Baptist was his cousin. And John the Baptist was his mentor. And because now John's followers, who were many, need someone else to follow. And it's only after the death of John the Baptist that the Jesus movement really starts to hit its stride. And we see now Jesus is now preaching to what? the multitudes and he's feeding the 5,000 which really is probably 10 or 20,000 because the 5,000 refers only to the men and the feeds the 4,000 etc and what's happening this movement now is really really taking hold and Jesus pivots again because Jesus realizes that God is in control of this movement. And he also knows that he can't stay stuck in Galilee anymore. And this time he pivots toward Jerusalem. And he goes to the west, to a big town, Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi was a big town that fell in Herod's patch, which made it a very dangerous place for the cousin of John the Baptist. And as they go together to Caesarea Philippi, Jesus knows that the nature of his ministry is going to change, and all things are going to head toward now his death and his resurrection. And he asks his disciples, who do the people say 
that I am? And gets the same answer that he expects. John the Baptist may be come back to life. Elijah, one of, the, one of the prophets of old. Then he turns to Peter. And he says to Peter, who do you, Peter, say that I am? And Peter famously says, thou art the Christ. Now, in our lectionary version today from the Gospel of Mark, it stops there and just says, Jesus says, don't say any more. But in the Matthew 16 version, it goes on. And it says that Jesus says to Peter, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, Peter, that on this rock, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I will give you, Peter, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you have loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Wow, that is a serious battlefield promotion. That is a serious battlefield promotion that Peter gets. And then our lectionary picks up, which is why I think you have to have the first part of the story before you understand verse 31 onward. And verse 31 says, as he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days again, rise, Peter takes him aside and rebukes him. I wonder how often we are like Peter. I mean, let's be honest with each other. Haven't there been times when you've wanted to rebuke the gospel or at least parts of the gospel? I mean, haven't there been times where you have found it really hard to love your enemies or impossible? to turn the other cheek, or you're just too busy to feed the poor, or you don't want to get your hands dirty to heal the sick, or you don't want to love the unlovely, or maybe you don't have the guts to speak truth to power. I've been like Peter a lot of times in my life. I suspect all of us have been like Peter sometimes. And whether we realize it or not, we're rebuking Jesus. And how many times have we rebuked Jesus when he commands us to be holy? When he demands that we are sexually pure? When he demands that we be countercultural? Because the fact of the matter is, after this scene, Jesus teaches a lot about what is expected of his disciples when it comes to holiness. And then he goes on to warn them about the cost of discipleship, the cost of following Jesus. He summoned the crowd and his disciples, and he said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. And of course, he's talking about eternal life. He says himself, I'm talking about your soul. And he warns, if you're ashamed of me, you're ashamed of my words in this adulterous, sinful generation. When I come in glory, I'm going to be ashamed of you. So here's the bottom line, folks. There is a big cost to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. You might lose friends because you weren't ashamed of Jesus Christ. You might lose your job because you aren't ashamed of Jesus Christ. 
If you're a pastor, you might even lose your job. You might be really unpopular at times. You might be canceled, to use the popular vernacular today, if you stand up for Jesus Christ and for the gospel. But you see, this is what Lent is all about. Lent is not about giving something up. You don't remember anything else I say this morning. Please remember this. Lent is about finding your cross. What is the cross that you need to bear for Jesus Christ? I'm going to be honest with you. I think the church has a cross to bear. I think our little community has a cross to bear. I think losing Abram is a tragedy in the life, in the history of our church. I really do. Not because he handled the situation perfectly, but because he handled it faithfully. And we need to be willing to hold up whomever our new pastor is when they act faithfully, whether they act in the way we would have acted or not. Here's the best part about having to find and carry our cross. We never have to carry it alone. Jesus, in fact, has already carried all of our crosses for us. When I was a young man, there was a Broadway musical called Carousel. And there was a beautiful song in it called You Never Walk Alone. And there have been many times in my life when I have felt rebuked the way Peter was rebuked. And I've thought of those words. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of the storm is a golden sky and the sweet silver sound of a lark. Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain, though your dreams be tossed and shorn, walk on, walk on with hope in your heart, and you'll never walk alone. Our wonderful little church will get through this storm, and there will be a lark and sunshine at the other end. But first, we have to find our cross, and we have to be willing to carry it before we enjoy the fruits of the risen Christ. Amen. Um, so we're going to do communion now, and um, if you need to uh, grab something, uh, some elements for yourself, some um, bread and, and juice or something to drink, you can uh, do that now. I'll wait just a second for a few people who went off screen.
Okay, so Paul, or, I'm not sure who's advancing the slides, but there we go. Um, as we express our unity by gathering at the Lord's table, we proclaim his death and look forward to his coming again. Jesus said, I am the living bread, which came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. The bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I am in them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Almighty Father, whose dear Son, on the night he was betrayed and suffered, instituted the ordinance of his body and blood, mercifully grant us that we may receive it thankfully in remembrance of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who in giving himself for us, gives us a pledge of eternal life to be appropriated by faith and who lives and reigns forever and ever, amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in the assurance of our eternal life with you, amen. Let us pray in the words our Savior Jesus Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The, the, body, the body of Christ broken for us, the bread of heaven. the blood of Christ shed for us, the cup of the new covenant. Let us pray. Eternal God, heavenly father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Know that because of the sacrifice of Christ in giving his body and his blood for us, we are counted as being totally free before the presence of the most holy God. Thanks be to God. <laughs> 